state in a true dopamine bound braid form. Uh, I am currently uploading our video clip for braid club as we speak. <laughs> Because that's how this goes. What is it right. that build, build the plane as we fly it? Oh yeah, no, it's literally it's build the plane as we fly it. It's um make the video as we play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how it goes. All right, let me close all things that are not this and. We will get ourselves started. I think it's I think <laughs> we can get started. Amazing. Well, um, hold on, let me turn on back up recording. I never remember. Brain. Recording ah. in progress. Amazing. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Brain Club. Um, I don't know everybody today, so I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Mel Hauser, I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director here at All Brains Belong. And uh, wh wh whether you're joining us here synchronously or, or joining us via the recording, very excited for this conversation. Um, so all month we have been talking about um, creating neuroinclusive spaces in different domains, whether that be um, at, in, 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 at the workplace, in our homes. And today we're going to think about um, what, it, what does it mean to create neuroinclusive social spaces? Oh, uh, that's not what I want. Where's the screen? All right, there we go. Okay. So um, if you would like closed captioning and if, it's, if, 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 if you've not figured out how to pop it up yet, um, depending on your version of Zoom, it's either the live transcript CC option or the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same things for hide subtitles. All right, we are revamping our intro, um, the ADB team. We, we, we revamped some things this week. So um, in uh, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, um, before I go into the usual things, I want to make a quick word on language. You will hear me and um, likely several other participants use identity first language. Um, for example, um, I am autistic. And, and, and that's because for me, that is part of my identity. Um, and so while uh, that, may be, that may be new, um, uh, if, if, uh, if, if this is your first brain club or your first brain club um, recording, um, but that's, that is what you, what you may hear. And while that's not a universal experience um, of neurodivergent people, um, it, is a, it is a common experience of neurodivergent people. So I wanted to make a word on language. Um, all forms of participation are okay here. You can have your video on or off. It's like, um, you figure that out already, many of you. And even if your video is on, we do not expect anything of you. We do not expect you to look at the camera. We don't expect you to sit still. Like, Eat, fidget, stim, move around, whatever, whatever needs doing. And you can communicate however you're most comfortable. You can unmute, you can type in the chat box, you can any, any, anything that works for you. And um, safety is really important to us. So in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, you'll hear us speak a lot about respecting and protecting one another's access needs. Um, so uh, for example, um, though you're welcome to talk about anything that you're comfortable talking about, just ask that if you're talking about something that you experienced as traumatic or distressing, just let every, everyone know about it first, like a content warning for the topic so that listeners can listen with informed consent versus leaving the room for a minute or turning their sound off and we'll, we'll type in the chat box with a content warning is over. And then new, um, we're gonna try this out. Um, uh, much like in uh, text-based virtual spaces, um, if a, 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 a topic is posted about, um, the moderators say, hey, please add a content warning. 
we are going to try to get your attention even synchronously here at Green Club to add content warnings because um, sometimes it's hard to know. It's hard to know uh, when do I give a content warning because a lot of times we get so used to our own distress. Okay, now we're ready to go. Neurodivergence and social relationships. Not surprisingly, neurodivergent people have higher rates of negative social experiences. Um, despite longing for social content, because we're all wired for connection. Um, and, um, and, and there's so many barriers to socializing and the literature would, 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 would confirm what, you know, anecdotally is, um, is, is many people's experience, which is that uh, social interactions can be exhausting, anxiety provoking, quite stressful. Um, but when we really think about the double empathy problem. This was our, our theme of Brain Club for August, where um, this is a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who is an autistic social scientist in the UK. Um, research showing that um, between neurodivergent people, um, communication is efficient. It is, um, it is nuanced. It is rich and rewarding. Um, there are, 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 as opposed to, um, uh, between mixed neurotype communication, um, non-autistic to non to to autistic and vice versa, it's miscommunication in both directions. So really, it's the mismatch of communication style and worldview um, that is responsible for a lot of the social stress. But that's not to say that that's the only social stress. Because what we've been talking about here at Green Club is when we think about access needs, access needs being anything that any of us need for meaningful for participation in our lives, conflicting access needs, want, needing the same thing that is the exact opposite of what someone else needs at the exact same time is also common even amongst neurodivergent social interactors. That's not a word, but you know what I mean. Um, so uh, this is this is this is my new favorite slide. I use this in a in a in a in a presentation um, to um, uh, to some professionals last week. Um, I asked Luna. I said, Luna, I'm about to give a neurocultural competency training. What should I tell them? And this is what my sweet little love had to say, Mama. Tell them there's no what, right way to be a person. And uh, my my and, and and of course she's like <laughs> sitting there with her mermaid dress, chewing on her chicken kebab. Anyway, I just I, I she's the best. So anyway, that is true. That is true. My sweet little love, she knows all the things, and she'll tell you that too. Um, so you know when we think about how do we create, you know, we heard the term safe space all the time. Like, I, you know, I, I personally, I find that term annoying sometimes because I think it's, it's, it's used a lot in spaces that don't feel safe to my nervous system. Um, so, so um, you know, I think that explicitly naming, um, there's no right way to be a person. There's no right way to socialize. There's no right way to, 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 to do most things. I think that is um, knowing that, naming that explicitly meets a lot of people's access needs because like it or not, um, there are a lot, of, a lot of spaces where it's not true that, that it's implicitly or explicitly the message is sent that there is a correct way to socialize, a correct way to play, a correct way to communicate. Um, and so that's, there's the, the trauma response that, you know, that, 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 that lives in many nervous systems that, that, that comes to bear in, in, in all future, future encounters. So what does that mean for safe space? I'm, my, my thesis, um, and, and I'd love to know what folks think about this, um, that truly a requirement for actually safe space is that we begin with a shared goal where the shared goal is that one, I will meet my own access needs and that I, I'm actually gonna try to not violate others' access needs. So many experiences, that shared goal is not established. It's not even considered because of privilege. All the many layers of privilege. So uh, I wonder, 
I wonder what it, what do you all think about that? Um, in terms of, is that cue for um, the shared goal of meet my access needs and not violate other people's access needs, is that well established in many of the social situations that you find yourselves in? Hey, I Mel. Think, yeah, go ahead. Hey, Gabe, go for it. Hey, well, I found your your brain matching thing interesting. I think that there, I think that's like the major, uh, the only example that came to mind, and this is weird, but it's like, I would never go to a rave and feel comfortable. That's just not my scene. Um, so I wouldn't choose to go to a rave. So I guess... What that means is like, um, if you're, if we're, if, you know, a group is putting together a social interaction, we have to like know the brains that are coming. Right. And then, but then likewise, I think for certain types of brains, part of social anxiety is like not knowing what you're walking into. And so being, being able to be transparent about what the space is going to be like. <clears throat> and I think also acknowledging like, you know, we want to be all inclusive, but, but allowing people to create their boundaries may mean that they don't, that's not their safe space this time. Um, so that was interesting with the, with the brain thing. And so I don't know if there, that's a jumping off point for anyone else, but that kind of really resonated with me it's a jumping off point for like literally my next slide <laughs> so, um, uh, so no tr truly I think that right not all spaces are going to be the spaces that 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 we may, we may choose but it's like the informed consent thing if I don't know what it is that I'm walking into I can't actually have conformed consent about like going and showing up. Hey, Sierra. Yeah, I just jumping off of what um, you both just said as thinking about like um, telling people what to expect at an event, in an interaction, in a relationship, whatever, giving people that um, information beforehand as one of the best ways to like have accessibility, whether or not you're able to meet the access needs of every single person who might want to come, giving people the information of this is what we're providing, this is what we're able to provide, having that kind of transparency is the way out of chaos. Um, and I think that's, I think that's really true with the relationships too, of like, hey, this is what I'm able to provide in this relationship. And does this work for you? Is this, am I getting what I want out of the relationship? Um, I think that, I think that works with a lot of different things. Absolutely. Um, Sarah. Yeah, I was just going to say too, like um, normalizing everybody having access needs to begin with. So um, not making it like a special accommodation to make it feel good for just a certain individual, but noting that we all have access needs. Um, I think that's a conversation that's really lacking in a lot of different, yeah, you know, places and experiences that I've had. So I think that's one thing that makes All Brains Belong unique in that way. Yeah, and I think that once we can give ourselves permission to be like, I get to show up, I get to have access needs. In fact, everybody does. It's just, it's, it's the start of something. And when we think about um, what goes into um, what, what, we, what, what, what we might define as a neuro-inclusive social event, not just a social exchange, but like if we're going to like, because um, we, 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 we were approached, I think back in June, right? Uh, so so we, were, we, were, we were approached by an organization in June to say like, will you help us 
develop like a menu, a menu, like a, like some guidelines of like, how would you actually structure um, some neuroclusive social events? And like, I don't think there's one great way to, to do that. But I do think that there is some, some, some element of stuff before, stuff during, and stuff after. Um, because for many people, it is an access need to be able to preview um, what, what, uh, what, what can be expected. How, how many people are going to be there? Where is it? Maybe what does it look like or feel like? What's going to happen there? Where's the bathroom? Will there be food? Will I, am I likely to get COVID there? You know, like those are all access needs. And the during, um, and I'm, I'm gonna use this, like this I think is a pretty cool graphic made by Janelle Starr, one of our uh, community advisory board members. Um, she just like banged this out at a, at, a, at a committee meeting one day. She's like, do, 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 yeah, I just, I just, I just, I just made this. Um, of all of the sensory aspects that go into um, day-to-day life. I'll send, the, I'll send this out. You don't have to like study it now. I'll, I'll send it out. I think it's really cool. Um, but, but that's not all. I think like Gabe said a few minutes ago, um, you got to know the brains in the room, right? So you got to know your own access needs, which most of us don't. Um, and, and maybe it starts from reflection on like, what really did not work for me? And maybe what are the themes of what that tells me about my access needs? Like, when did I not feel comfortable? When did I not feel safe? When did I not feel fully able to participate? Um, that, um, but, but, but knowing everyone else's access needs also, and you can, you can know those things because you have a pre-existing relationship, but more often than not, you're going to be in situations where you don't know the people, and so it's 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 uh, it, it goes back to I think we had we bring club back in July about like not expecting mind reading. So normalizing these are my access needs, and I'm gonna I'm gonna share them with you, and to create a culture where that happens, I think is really the the only way for people to to know other people's access needs. And, you know, we can normalize that there's no right way to participate. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna unshare because I wanna pull up this graphic that, that I think is cute. Um, all right, here. There we go. Uh, when I when I was homeschooling Luna when she was three, Luna has the kind of brain that uh, really um, it's an access need to have a, a top down structure to like organize information to follow. So she really was did not feel safe attending. This is pre COVID attending a play date until it was named that there's no correct way to participate at a play date. There are in fact, and you know, there's like a million different ways to play with friends, but this was the structure I came up with. You can, it, it's, it's actually a thing that observation, like somebody, somebody shared before the spring club, like, oh, hey, you know, I'm gonna be driving. I'm probably not gonna, you know, chime in. Like you never have to chime in because observation is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a format of participation. Parallel play at all ages is totally legit. That's what going to a concert is. That's what, you know, like I, I, I remember being a little kid and, uh, you know, I, I, I'd have play dates with, 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 with this one friend and we would read books side by side. And that's how we played. But like, there's something about, you get this message of like, well, you know, playing with friends is when you like all play together cooperatively, like once you're two years old, like parallel plays over. That's not a thing. Like parallel play at all ages is totally legit. Um, anyway, so that, um, and then like, I think the last big picture point um, that I'm hoping we can spend the rest of our time talking about today, because it's a big one, is naming and navigating conflicting access needs, you know, conflicting access needs like, you know, Luna needs to make noise at the exact same time that I need complete silence in order to think. Conflicting access needs, it doesn't mean either one of us is correct, it's that we have to just acknowledge this conflict and, you know, bring some transparency to it 
if nothing else. Um, and you know, it, it, and and how do we how do we protect our own access needs? Protect other people's access needs. Having a plan for course correction when access needs are not met. How do we respond to that? Because I think not having a plan for that is how we a lot of people end up in social experiences that are not are, are not safe at a limbic level. I'm going to play a video that I think actually uploaded in time, just in time. Incredible. So this is, um, oops, I don't, okay, I have to stop share and share the sound separately. Um, so, th so this is Lizzie Peratt, uh, who is um, our educational programs coordinator, um, new to our ABB team. Um, uh, this, this, this is th these are the kinds of conversations that we have, like, for, like you know, in, like, like uh, casually. We have these like deep, 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 big picture. What's the meaning of life? Conversations all day around here, and sometimes we record them and turn them into brain clubs. So here we go. So we have this situation, right, where there's often conflicting access needs. I need a thing and you need the opposite of the thing at the same time. And neither one of them are correct. And they just are. And we also have a situation where sometimes in when people infringe upon another's access need they don't know that they did like they say something like um they say something and like my limbic system like nah! and i might be able to cortically override my limbic response maybe i can maybe i can't but even if i can i still think that energetically my energy goes into the space, my energy of like recoil. And then I think that energy for some people, I think they feel it. And when we think about rejection sensitive dysphoria, if someone either verbally or energetically gives you course correction, it is often really uncomfortable. So I have no, I don't know how to navigate this. I think the, I mean, all I, all I know is that like acknowledging it and bringing it to light, like transparency is the way out of chaos. I think this is like that, that applies here, but I don't know what else we do, but it's, uh, it's a thing. It's definitely a thing. I don't know what to do. I mean, I've heard that like one time I heard that someone tries to envision like a bubble of golden light around them when they're thinking about the energy coming at them but i mean for me it's hard for me. like i only see pictures when i dream so i feel like that could work if you can have a visual images in your brain but for me i can't do that so interestingly so you're just you're talking about you're referring to like strategies for like how to be in a space to protect yourself energetically that's cool yeah. What do you do when you're the facilitator and you can witness access needs being violated? How do you cue safety to protect the access needs of some while not inducing rejection sensitive dysphoria in others. I, I literally have no idea. I'm a terrible facilitator. I'm like an absolutely terrible facilitator. I have no idea. But like, I feel like when I'm the facilitator, I have like an extra burden, yeah. an extra burden responsibility of protecting the participants maybe that's just me but like that's maybe it's a brain rule but like i don't know i i really do operate 
under the guidance of like what you permit you promote yeah i agree and there's so much there's so much lit there's so many like ableist microaggressions at events i attend there's so much like just language or attitudes or vibes that 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 i'm seeing like i can zoom out and watch that energetic battle of like i bring this energy to this space you know from, from the impact of that energy on other people like i see it and i just want to shut it down all the time but then i'm like oh, well i know that if, i i don't really know how to shut it down because i know that rejection rejection sense of dysphoria is a thing and i often like i'm often at events where like i like 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 i'm a captive i'm a captive where like i hear the thing and i'm like i want I, I can't escape this thing because in order to stop this thing would mean interrupting the thing and i can't interrupt and yeah yeah and i think energetically too then you're sitting there and then you're getting depleted you know because you're seeing all that energy so it could be really tiring on yourself. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's interesting. I was um last week, um, I was at an event. It was not our event. Um, and energetically it was uncomfortable. And someone who I know was at the event and they left. And later they shared that they left because they anticipated that their nervous system might become uncomfortable with what might come next. So they were protecting their nervous system. Was, the idea of being able to say like, not safe for my nervous system, not healthy, I'm out of here. Um, I never do that. No, I don't either. And then it's always just recovery afterwards, you know, and then you're just depleted and it's like, oh, you took a hit that day, you know? Totally. And not just that day, but it could be like recovering for like several days. Like yeah. this, this particular event, I, my nervous system found so uncomfortable that like, I mean, I'm still not really regulated. It was like six days ago. So anyway, it's like when you have the kind of nervous system that is so porous to energy, um you you I, I it becomes an access mood thing of in order for me to meaningfully participate in literally anything for the rest of the week i need to protect my energy now yeah and so maybe it's just naming that up front of like part of the ground rules here or that we need to figure out a way to like how do we give feedback you know like sometimes i go sometimes i attend meetings and you know people talk about like well safe space it's a safe space like no it, it's not a safe space safe space is at the level of the beholder you know like i if i don't it's, it's it's like inclusion like only the person can 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 decide whether they feel they belong like only the person each individual person can decide whether they feel safe so it's like well, what do you need to feel safe i need there to i need energetically to feel safe and the energy that i put out into the world i think is determined by what i'm thinking how i see the world my attitudes about a topic um and i don't think people think about that at all and so unknowingly they bring energy into a space that is um you know, energy, attitudes, thoughts, they matter just as much as what comes out of, a, you know, a person's, you know, overt communication. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, people aren't thinking about their energy and maybe they're just so used to having that type of energy too. They, they think that's all there is. Ooh. I think that is true. I think that is true. Um, I do think that as a facilitator, one of the things that I can maybe 
do better at is like laying the ground rules maybe more specifically and maybe um, I think in the beginning of ADB we used to be we used to remember to put the ground rules in the chat mm -hmm. so like you have the slide but then the slide is gone yeah. so like reminding this business of of access needs reminding about content warnings you really do want much like this person who left this thing last week to protect their nervous systems we want all people to be able to protect their nervous systems yeah and and i think also to have even maybe add a ground rule where that it, it's okay you know if you have to leave the meeting you don't need to feel bad you don't need to feel ashamed that you know you're protecting your energy and and that's a wise thing to do i love that I love that so much. That's really important. Giving people permission yeah. to, to do what needs doing. Um, mm -hmm. It seems though that um, we have to find a way to talk about this, that it's um, when, when you unknowingly infringe upon someone else's access needs, there are definitely cues for example if someone says something and i like recoil um i don't have a way i don't i i i don't give feedback i cortically override but yet i'm energetically still you know i'm i'm i can't control what energy goes out into the world i can i can hit my mute button um you know that that's my accommodation for impulse control but like energy it just comes out of me pour us in pour us out and as the facilitator i have to both set expectations concretely and have a have a way of course correcting to protect the group's collective experience so we didn't solve this problem i still have no idea um you know uh the the idea of how do you course correct like we've left this we we've 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 left the ground rules how do we get back without induce without without uh potentially infringing upon more access needs hey gabe go for it <clears throat> I mean, it's it's kind of interesting to me that you talk about struggling with this because you were always like my mentor in terms of acknowledging, you know, someone will say something that may seem um, like off topic, like if you were giving a presentation or something and you would always go, interesting, tell me what you mean by that. Or like you would give them permission to like, to express or explain whatever was going on in their brain. So to me, you were always like very good at that. Um, <clears throat> but I guess what what I'm trying I'm trying to like picture what kind of settings or meetings are we imagining this this being at? Is this just like all brains belong, or is this like community events, or is this like um yeah like what kind of events are we specifically talking about that's interesting i don't think i have anything in particular in mind i mean let's even take for oh hey and you go for it um <clears throat> i think i might need to have a content warning um i'm not sure how that works i also don't know how to raise my hand um the so, way you raised your hand was just fine okay. so yeah so content warning what's the name of the topic uh social engagement <laughs> okay. uh, um i think why i want to we have a content warning because um you know i think i think i really agree with gabe around like being in this space and really feeling like you facilitate this that the you know everyone's access needs are you know fine you can interact and i've really um being so late di late uh, in life diagnosed autistic, my whole um, engagement is wrapped around masking and the continual 
so no one would know anything was wrong with me ever. In fact, like in a lot of feedback that I get is like, I'm the shining star, you know, I'm working so hard that it's like, I'm the shining star of any social. And, but I get in the car and I turn to my husband and say, how did I do? Like, did I do okay? Like, there's no ability to have had any body awareness of like where I was in that interaction. And it's been interesting for me coming here because it's a constant, like, I know I can be myself. I know I can be here. I know I could like not have my video on or I could, you know, and I don't know how to be here, even when there's full permission. Like I still don't feel safe because I have created, which like wonderfully, right? Created this mask for survival. Uh, that's probably the, like the content warning is like, I created this masking system brilliantly for my own survival that now that I'm undoing it, um, because I don't want to be on the couch for three days. I don't want to be socially isolated of having to leave an environment because my my nervous system will be set off. And I'm literally getting to the point of death and immobility because I can't, I have no way to move within that. And so there's some, for me, the stake just becomes, I either like sit in the woods by myself or I completely blow out my nervous system, but this all brains belong is giving, you know, and the somatic work I'm doing with the therapist is giving me a third way, which is like putting my camera on and like talking tonight and showing that vulnerability and thinking about like Brene Brown's theory about like joy is the like the hardest emotion to feel because it requires vulnerability and we're in a culture that vulnerability is set up so that we're basically like protecting ourselves before we even know there is needed to be protection like we're using all of this accumulated body um dissociation and um alteration of our like essence in order to avoid being vulnerable which then we don't get joy and so there's something about the permission that's here all brains belong that's like practice for like calling out maybe or reminding i remember there was one session that something was happening and i know that i felt triggered in some ways by it but not like negatively like about the person but I could all of a sudden I don't even know if it was me that you just were like okay let's just like zoom back out for a minute like not to dismiss like there is this way this this play and this dance um that I just wanted to recognize in myself because even with permission even in like the safest space that's been created that I could be and show up for I still don't feel safe for in myself I still question I'm still flat on my back when I share and I'm literally gonna just like own that now and like I'm in my body and like I'm not gonna shame myself for speaking tonight like I'm really gonna try not to thanks I love love everything you just said and like so so many other people did you were like lots of nods and lots of lots lots of hearts and lots of people typing in the chat saying I can totally relate so relatable like I mean anyway like I think it's like you name the thing and like I mean I'm a big Brene Brown fan also and when I think about the shame factor of like I'm the only one who like can't just do the thing it's like no no it's it, it is a lot of people who feel this, just not everyone can, can, can enter into the space of vulnerability to name the thing. And like the, the, the more people name the thing and like, you, you, it's almost like um, somebody once said to me, safety, like if you've never, like how, if, if you've never felt safe, how will you, how will you recognize like what the difference is between safe and not safe. Like you have to have the experience of showing up authentically and, 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 and for then to, to even notice, like for me now, it's really interesting because 
as as someone who's also late diagnosed autistic, um, I, you know, I didn't even, I didn't know how much I was masked. I didn't know like at all. I mean, I was my mask. And now um, when I say that people are like, how do people not know you're autistic? So there's like that. Um, but there's also this element of like, now when I'm in situations where I feel unsafe, I notice it because I don't spend most of my day in those environments anymore. And I'm actually affected in a much, so it's interesting, like, I mean, like you mentioned, you know, the, 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 the dissociation and, 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 and all of the compensatory strategies that your limbic system does to keep you alive. Like, thank goodness for that, you know, because, because, because otherwise it's intolerable. But but now um, you know part of part of unlearning all of that it brings back brain body connection and sometimes that sucks also um, like now when I'm in unsafe environments um, like social environments um, I feel it at a level that I never felt it before. It was always that way. I just stuffed it. I'm reading in the chat, um, can relate to masking that Amy's talking about. So uh, content warning, being invisible as a masking autistic. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to be so good at masking that after we were married, my first partner told me that he wouldn't have married me if he had known that I didn't like socializing when I finally refused to socialize because of what it cost me. He said that since people are usually good at what they enjoy, he thought that I enjoyed socializing when it was exhausting because of the masking. And like Amy mentions, no one had the ability to know. And I didn't know that I was masking, just that I was constantly performing normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say thank you for Amy as well, because so I've heard a lot about masking through talking to this group. Well, it's the only group where I've heard it probably. <laughs> and every time I've heard it, I said, oh, that's not me. I don't do that. I've never done that. Oh, well, there's other people talking about that. No, that's not true. Somehow the way that Amy described it tonight, it's like, whoa, OK, actually, I have been. I've actually been unsafe at almost at all times and been masking to an exhausting degree at every single moment. And it's just it's kind of mind blowing. So at first I had something else to say and then I kind of got speechless because what Amy, was, Amy said was like, oh my God, wait a minute. I just, she named the thing and somehow she named it in a way that we relate so strongly. I think that people that have been in denial about masking and maybe other people have just realized this mind blowing revelation that uh, feels like, it's just so striking. I don't know. But I guess now I do remember what I was going to say. I don't want to change this topic, though, but I'm just, well, it was because it was related to when you were talking about um, ground rules and setting ground rules. And I was thinking about specifically about like interactions through Zoom teams, whether there's social work, whatever it is, you know, this has also happened to me when I try to engage with social groups as well, where they, they I guess, so-called neurotypical people seem to, you know, think that it's their prerogative to set ground rules based on normalized behaviors so that the, the typical standard for how to behave in, in Zoom or Teams, and there's a bullet, you know, list of items, and it always says, okay, sit still, you know, no distractions, you raise your hand at this certain time or whatever, or, you know, that's the only way you can, you can, you can interact is to raise your hand. If you don't, then you don't have manners. And and just like, you know, type in the chat during this time, but not this time, not that time. And then if you're, you know, have anything going on in the background then you're not paying attention and you don't care, that's just a standard. And then another thing too is breakouts, okay? They said, this is the, these are the rules of the breakouts. You know, we're gonna ask you like five things to do at once. And then you go through a fire drill whether it's good for your brain or not, because we all say that our ground rule is that it's good for our brain and that works. So then you get to go through that, which is really terrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like the prerogative of saying, setting the ground rules. Well, what about our prerogative? What about, uh, what, I mean, I have not, I've been an advocate of myself. I stand up for myself constantly, but in those situations where there's ground rules set and there's like 50 people in a group and you don't, you don't really know them. I have not yet stopped them and said, okay, wait, wait a minute. Here's my PowerPoint slide about the, the, uh, the, all the, my ground rules that are 
hundred percent in conflict with every bullet point you have. And let's talk about that. How can we do that? That's a question. I mean, like that takes a little bit of, I mean, I'm brave, but I haven't done that yet. I had to go through the, you know, the brain hell through the breakouts and all those other things and, and mask. You know, I, I heard, um, I don't, or no, I saw it in the chat. The, the idea that, that masking or a, um, a clue to whether or not you're masking is um, a point of absolute exhaustion. And it really brought back um, uh, my experience the week I took off the last week in July um, when for my first three days of my vacation, like Saturday, Sunday, Monday, um, I couldn't watch television. Um, I couldn't, um, I couldn't focus on anything and my body temperature was fluctuating like crazy. And all I did was sleep for three days. And, um, and that really helped just bring home that, that, you know, environments can be crafted for every individual and, um, um, nobody should be that tired, um, um, because they're forced to work in a system that doesn't meet their access needs. And, and I think, uh, you know, it sounds so much like common sense, but I think this message that we are slowly starting to spread, <laughs> um, um, around um, is actually revolutionary. Um, and, you know, I'm so pleased to be part of the effort to make access um, the rule. And, and it's almost mind blowing that it's not the rule, right? But in every, in every um, space in our lives, we are only as quote unquote disabled as um, as there are barriers to our forward uh, to our potential, um, and um, yeah, that's yeah. Thank you for whoever posted that in the chat. You you turned a light bulb on in my head. I had this epiphany the other day with my patients. We had a group medical visit and we were talking about mast cell activation, my monotropic focus, because I'm always talking about mast cell activation. Anyway, so the idea is the mast cell is your, uh, your immune system's uh, first line of defense to say safe, not safe. And there's a lot of people um, with all kinds of chronic health stuff that these mast cells are dysregulated. Um, they are unhinged, secreting all kinds of stuff into the body that results in all kinds of, 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 of struggles and strife. The thing is, they're correct, those mast cells. It's not safe. So, like, it occurred to me that, like, the fastest way to get the people better, the fastest way to help myself feel better is to actually leave the unsafe environment. I can throw all the medicines at people in the universe, but it's unsafe out there. Whoa. Mal, that's making me think of something. Sorry, I, I can't see everyone, so I don't know if someone else raised a hand or something. Um, <clears throat> So I have a particular particular social, I call it a barrier, but um, not barrier, um, boundary. Uh, I get, I, I don't, I find myself to be a social person, but if I don't know people slash it's not safe, I, but I'm like obligated to participate for whatever reason. Um, my safe space is the snack table. <laughs> because no one will talk to you if you're eating most of the time. And that allows my brain to like read the room and kind of like be in the space where I'm 
I'm, I'm present, but I'm like inaccessible and I can like, like just adjust to what kind of environment I'm in. And I mean, none of us, like, I don't think intentionally choose to be in an unsafe space. And that time I think allows my brain to assess the level of quote unquote danger or safety. Um, and it's been, it's been something I've, I, I've, I didn't realize that I did until, uh, I don't know, a year, two years ago or something, but anyways, um, in, in talking about creating that, like, that's an example of, is there like, you know, a quiet space or a snack table metaphorically or actual everyone loves snacks anyways that can be a part of an event or you know a gathering that's like that's safe and I think I've experienced that in these zoom videos I mean like I've I've neuro lurked in like a bunch of these a few times and <clears throat> Mel didn't really once ever call me out and like make me introduce myself I was just kind of still like reading the room and and everything like that um, and so I think the question is, you know, given the, the setting, what would be the representation of that, of that safe space, that snack table, but then also like the exit door, like I maybe watch too many, like, um, action movies with like people always like looking for like the exit doors or whatever, but like also knowing like, where's the exit door and how are we making that like not shameful? If someone's like, Nope, Nope, not safe. This is like, not my energy. I'm, you know, how do we do that at the same time by encouraging people also, like you were mentioning Mel and, and Amy also making an example, like, encouraging the identification of that without shame so that you're better at knowing, okay, it's time for the exit door, like yesterday, you know, knowing that in that moment so that you aren't, you don't end up draining yourself so often. Amen to that. Normalize the exit door. I have a, um, I have a, well, I think it's funny. I hope other people do too, but, um, I did a, um, an art project in graduate school for my aunt who had passed away. I did an altar uh, like they do in, in Mexico. And when I set it up in the room, um, I got there late and there was really no space. And so um, I had to set it up next to the door, right under the fire alarm. And the, and the teacher that was running the exhibit was so apologetic. Oh, I'm so sorry. You had to, you had to, put your, your aunt's uh, uh, altar in that tiny space. And I'm like, oh, no, you're right by the door under the fire alarm. It's exactly where she'd want to be. And uh, she was brilliant. And I look back on her life and, you know, she was probably neurodivergent as well. But uh, right there by the door, and boom, out the minute she needed to be. That was her. That's amazing. Hi, Sierra. Hi, sorry, I ran away to get a to get a prop. Um, one thing, so um, I recently got married and had COVID during my wedding. Um, and it was kind of great because we created a little isolation tent. I didn't have to talk to anybody. I didn't want to. And it was a really cool like experience of kind of intentionally creating that safe space of that like this is a zone where there's no expectation of how to interact. This is a zone where you can just come and sit and don't have to talk and don't have to think. And I think another way that I've seen people do that is use things like pins. So um, if anybody's ever in the office, we have a wall of pins and two of my favorite ones are please don't crowd me. It's not gonna show up very well. And I don't feel like talking. And so I think having something that you're non-verbally showing like, hey, this is me. And you can kind of create that space in those places of being like, hey, it's similar to like wearing a um, rainbow bracelet can create a safe place, safe place wherever you are for queer and trans people. Um, like outwardly saying, hey, you don't have to do small talk with me. You don't have to interact in a certain way you can create that safe space wherever you are, which is a really cool thing. 
That's why we put on our our banner at the at, at any time we've done a tabling event. We put the we put a banner with a sign that says like small talk not required. We found that way more people approach the table. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, and, 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 and speaking of tables, um, I once did a table at this outdoor thing this summer and people were talking with me and it was like, okay, but like, I, I, I was done and I, I didn't know how to exit the conversation. It had been a while. Like, I don't actually get a whole lot of practice anymore at like the exit door because I don't, I, I, I kind of have designed a, 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 this a, a totally a layer, layer of privilege that I mostly don't have to leave things. Things leave on their own a lot in my world. Um, but anyway, um, I, 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 I had been talking about masking. I was trying to explain to some parents about like what, what it is and like why we need to discourage this and like why it's bad for mental health and like all of this. And I was like, okay, so like, I'm gonna give you an example. I need to be done with this conversation. And it was so hard and I got looks, oh, it was terrible. But like, it, I was done. I think it's okay. Just, the more you do it, the more you realize that nothing totally catastrophic happened by asserting and protecting access needs. And almost always, when you know if you see someone do something and you're like oh man i wish i could do that just you made it possible for someone else to do it like it's kind of like you know amy when you shared what you shared like think about how many other people felt safe to show up and do the name the thing yeah and my question is like how do you find the exit door when you're doing something for somebody else okay so i'm a very sociable person i i like i like you know really shine in environments that i choose that I know that I feel happy in like and of course when I'm doing something for my son I, I feel happy because I'm you know observing something he's doing at a school or a social event or something I'm very happy to do that I love doing that it's such it brings so many good memories however in those environments I feel like for, for my, my example is that I, I like really don't feel like I fit in at all to the like suburban housewife stereotype and <laughs> like I I feel like in those events, even though I'm enjoying and, and, and cherishing the memory of seeing what my son is doing, um, I notice that I have like a totally different, like I have like a defensive posture, tactics for people not to talk to me as much, you know what I mean? Just what I have to do, that type of thing. It's like, but you can't exit because you're doing something for someone you really care about. So how do you, you can't really exit. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and and I, I, I wonder, I mean, I, I relate to that. Like, I, I relate hard to that. Um, and 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 I I I wonder if if others have any any strategies. You know, I think that like that's what Lizzie was talking about um, in the beginning of that video clip about like the visualization of like the the energy bubble, the glow, or something like. You know, that's that's that's. Uh, that's an example. I think of the same thing of like deciding to not pretend to do the thing that is just so uncomfortable versus, you know, and it, 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 it's like this fine line between um, what am I doing out of obligation? That's when you leave, but I actually want to be here. How do I just feel safer while being here? That's like a complete, like, like I think you have to decide what path of the algorithm you're on. Amy. I'm not, um, I'm really still at the very beginning of learning this, but I <clears throat> had just been on a trip. So I hadn't really been around certain dynamics. And when I got back, I was in this really quiet, grounded space. And the minute I started talking to some family members, I just could feel like the, my limbic system just like, but I really wanted to check in and talk with them. And I got really overwhelmed and I brought it to my somatic therapist and they were basically kind of saying the thing that I, I've witnessed um, you do, Mel, um, which is basically in the moment you could say, hey, could we just zoom out because I'm really not in the space of being able to hear all the details you're giving me or like, um, like they'll say things like if you're in a social situation and you're not like you're you know you're saying that you're standing in like a certain posture or whatever 
but it, in a certain way, if like someone came up and you just could feel like, I don't want to talk to this person, it'd be more like, Hey, I would really love to give you all of my attention. And I'm just feeling really quiet right now. Like all these like little things that I was like, it, I'm so much more would just do the like smile and nod or like social engage. But to this, I guess what I keep calling like the third way where you can still be with yourself and also have room to, and I think what, what I've been learning is like so much of my social interactions, I'm reading the room so intently that I've literally lost myself and I'm in everybody else's business instead of be, staying within my own. And what I've been learning is like, if I can stay in my own space in terms of my own experience, which is really hard. And then, and then the engagement is what happens between them and me. And always for, I don't know if anyone can relate to this, but for me, my, my whole experience is over there. It's not here. And so now it's sort of like, if I can say, then, then I can follow my values instead of my brain rules. I can follow the, my values. And what I've been learning lately is like the, my uh, Elsa said to me like, oh, now that you know you're autistic, like, like you've all, always known, but, or you've known for a while, but now that's like diagnosed, now you get to follow your values and not the brain rules. And when I, when I fell into that, I realized when I go to the brain rules, I go to the person, I go outside myself. And when I go to my value, I I'm included. And I have to say that one thing has changed so many social interactions because I'm not leaving them out because my value would be like kindness, like not being rude, like all of the, the things I think we're supposed to, I guess we're supposed to do or not. I don't know. But, um, but what I notice is like, when I stay in my values, I honor what's happening for me. And then I have more room to, to communicate in a way that wouldn't be like, considered blunt or rude, even though, you know, um, that's okay to, to do that as well. But it's more of like, how do I want to present myself? How do I want to be and not get overwhelmed? And that, that has, even though I'm really new at it, that might just be a, a way, um, one way to do it. I can't imagine a more epic way of, of, of wrapping up this conversation because um, like, like Laura said in the chat, Amy, you are on fire tonight. So well said. It's so well said. Like if you lead with your values, this is about you and your experience, not about failing to, 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 to show up in someone else's experience. It's your, it's your movie. And, 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 and that's not the, that like, that really is such an important brain rule to unlearn that the, that, that, that the point is to fit in and feel comfortable while fitting in. Like that's the package we were sold. It's a package. And um, as, 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 as Carolyn says, thank you. Thank you for the inspiration. Uh, because I think that, you know, we, we, we can all do this thing and you're, we're not the only ones doing the thing. We're all doing the thing. Um, and it's, um, it's about like, you know, just, just even, even if it, you know, in, in Nina's example, if you're, you know, at some thing that, that, that you want to be at, but your brain rules are luring you toward like the, the, the old version of your appraisal of the last time you were at all the other times you were at events like this. It's not those events. It's this event, the one you want to be at leading with your values and being in your own experience. It's sort of like, and I know we're wrapping up, but it's sort of like the people in the margins are always the ones who have had to adjust and adapt. And if the, you can come to a place of, I'm not going to adjust and I'm not going to adapt, and then I'm going to let the environment to actually show me so I don't actually have to feel safe. The environment gets to stay unsafe and I get to remain safe because I can see if there's room and fluidity. Like if you're on a Zoom chat and you stay within that and you say, hey, these 
I agree with all these ground rules and I'd love to add these three or four extra ones that would help accommodate me while I'm on the Zoom. And then that's not met, then you get to see, wait, this is not an environment that's actually just like basically respecting me. So how do I want to participate or move because I'm not actually even being respected? Um, so I, yeah. Amen to that. And remembering that, um, you know, connection, right? Connection is the path forward. And so, you know, I can't tell you how many times I'm in unsafe Zooms or I'm like sending secret chats to Laura Lewis um, or, or texting with some of my board members. Like a co-regulation is, is what's required. You don't have to do it alone. And I think that's, it's about like creating a new culture um, where what we're all talking about is not on the margins anymore. This, this is the culture. Um, and which is, which is why I'm very excited to say that next month's Brain Club theme for November is about neurodivergent culture. And, um, and, and, and because it's interesting, I'm doing, I'm doing a LEND fellowship, uh, Leadership in Neurodevelopmental Disability. Um, and, and there's all this really important discussion about the intersect of, of, of disability and culture. Not yet have I heard a discussion about neuroculture, not once yet. Um, and so th this, this part of um, of, 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 of cultural competency is like unlearning the, like, um, the, 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 the oppressive messages, um, that are, 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 are driven at, um, coercive assimilation that in a way that is traumatic and unsafe and bad for health. And so forward. See you next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much.